Hey kids, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Now today, I wanna to bring you my lessons learned video on this, the incredible uh, GL1800 Goldwing from Honda. An absolutely amazing bike. You can already tell that this is gonna be somewhat of a gushing review. I've had this bike for over a month now, and uh, I've used it in all sorts of conditions, in all sorts of weathers, uh, even including a bit of touring with the missus on the back. I really got to know the bike, and I think it's an absolute brilliant machine. It's been with us now in one form or other for 45 years, would you believe, and it has become somewhat of an icon. Even people that don't know anything about bikes recognize a Honda Goldwing when they see one. Anyway, uh, enough of the gushing. Let's crack on with the lessons I've learned about the bike. So this particular example of the machine that I've been riding uh, is a 2020 spec bike. Basically, uh, they, the bike has been changed obviously over the 45 years that it's been around. And this recent uh, incarnation came out back in 2018. And uh, today in 2020, it's still the same bike, but uh, it's, it is an incredible bit of kit. It's kind of a showcase for what you can do technology-wise on a motorcycle. It's laden with technology. Uh, it's handling is incredible for such a big old beast. It's, uh, it's heavy, but it's super powerful. This particular one I've got is the DCT one. And I've just been super, super impressed with this bike. No bike is perfect, however, are they? So uh, let me take you through the lessons I've learned, starting with the not so good stuff, sorts of things you may not pick up if you just had, say, a one hour test ride on one of these things. Okay, let's get on with the negatives then. Okay, to my first thing on the very short negative list about the Honda Goldwing then, and that is something that I learned when I went touring with my missus to Wales. If you haven't seen those videos, by the way, they're elsewhere on the channel, so remember, I'll stick a link to our Wales tour and you'll get to see what it's like actually living with the bike over a period of days. But one of the things we learned on that tour was that the panniers aren't quite big enough if you want to go on tour. One of the criticisms of this recent incarnation of the bike is that they did make the panniers and the boot, for want of a better word, a bit smaller than uh, on the previous bikes, and we found that too. Uh, not only is it small, and I'll try and see if I can get a helmet in a minute just to demonstrate, um, the, I found that things like getting into the side pannier that was on the downward sloping side, so where the bike is lent over, you can see this particular pannier is quite low to the ground, so it's quite hard to get into. The button itself is here, and then by the time you've opened it, getting in there, it's quite quite difficult. The access hole isn't very big, and actually it's, it's not very large in there. If we try uh, to put a helmet in, and here we go, this is my Array Rebel, which isn't a particularly big helmet, in fact it's one of my smallest helmets, you can see it's a bit of a struggle, especially with one hand, to go in. In fact, let me put the camera down a second. In fact, no way could I get that helmet in there even using two hands. So you can't get a helmet in the side case. Let's try uh, the top one. Okay, all these cases, one of the good things, by the way, is it's completely got central locking on here. So I've got the key, which is keyless, in my pocket. And it means that I can just undo uh, the panniers. We can remember where the button is, there we go, uh, on all these. Now this one is bigger, as you can see, but will it pass the helmet test? Uh, yes is the answer, look at that. So my Array Rebel will fit in there and it looks like I could probably get two helmets in there as well. But they're the small ones. If you try a bigger helmet like my uh, Tor X4, also from Array and nicely colour coordinated, I think you're going to struggle. Hmm doesn't want to shut with that in there so yeah a bit of a squeeze once you're onto the bigger helmet so uh, yeah a bit of a thumbs down is the uh, message on the pannier sizing okay so much for the uh, pannier sizing what's the next thing on my short negative list well the next thing is to do with uh, traveling again uh, if you're out on tour and this one came specifically from mrs flyer my passenger she said that even though she absolutely loved the back of this because this is incredible with this big effectively armchair on the back with these uh, with these armrests a really comfortable place to be for your pillion she said that she found it hard to hold on the grab handles are here as you can see um, and they're right down your side and you can't really get your hand around them so easy uh, the upside of that is you don't really need to hold on because you can actually you can grab hold of the, the arms here and you're and you feel very secure on the seat uh, if you want to hear more about what it's like to be a passenger on here then again uh, check out my other videos on the bike uh, i do have my missus talking about what it's like to be a passenger on here uh, but yeah she did say grab handles bit of an issue uh, otherwise brilliant for a passenger Okay, next up, kind of an obvious one for a bike like this and probably something that is in most people's minds when they're thinking about the Honda Goldwing and that is the weight of the bike. Is that an issue? Well, uh, first of all, it's not an issue when you're riding it. it. All the weight disappears. That's always the same on big heavy bikes. But uh, it is an issue, the weight, uh, if you're on, say, a gravel car park. There was one occasion where I felt like I may drop the bike 
Uh, it was early on in my tour with the bike and I quickly learned how to handle it. Um, so you do have to be super careful. It's over 300 kilograms. It's a big old beer moth of a bike. Uh, if it goes over that critical point, you are going to drop it. Uh, there are some plus sides to that even though, even though that's a negative point, of course, it is a heavy bike. Um, I'm told if you were to drop it, it doesn't go over very far because you've got these bits here that are effectively like engine guards, both on the back and the front. And apparently the bike only tips over that far. So it's actually, you can lift it up. I haven't tested that, but that's the theory. Um, and then the other thing is Honda have thought of this of course and they've equipped the bike with what they call a creep mode so often people talk about the bike having a reverse gear well it doesn't really have a reverse gear what it has is a little switch on the handlebars here see that basically you hit that um, with the brake in and then it enables you to press this button to take you backwards or the button on the front will allow you to creep forward and it uses I think it's the starter motor to do that so it goes very slowly it starts slowly and gets faster as you keep the button held down and you go forwards or backwards in a nicely damped way so even if you are on a horrible gravel car park and you've got other you know you're afraid you're going to drop the bike then you probably won't because you can use the forward and reverse creep mode absolute thumbs up for them so uh, even though it's a negative the weight they thought of it and they kind of uh, counteracted it so even that's not an issue one thing that very definitely is an issue with the bike though, uh, along with the wind keep blowing my list away, so sorry about that, is, uh, is the cost of the bike. It is an expensive machine. If you want to buy a brand new one of these, call to the website, it'll cost you in the region of 30 grand. 30,000 pounds for a motorcycle, I think, in anybody's book, is a lot of money, but it is, you know, it's, a, it's the Starship Enterprise of bikes. I can understand why it's expensive. When you ride one of these, you, uh, well, I guess you love it or hate it. I definitely am obviously in the love it camp. I never thought I'd say that about a Goldwing, but uh, if you're in the hate it camp and you ever get a chance to ride one, have a go at one, I think you'll be quickly converted. So yeah, the cost is very definitely a negative. And then linked with that uh, is the image of the bike. For some reason, but a bit like um, with Harley Davidsons and even BMW GSs, people don't like Harleys or they don't regard them as bikes or proper bikes. I'm not sure why that is. I like all two wheeled uh, motorcycles personally. Uh, but I also had a little bit of that prejudice. I've seen these before on ferries and things with trailers and thought what is going on there and didn't really get it but uh, within first time I ever rode one of these within 10 seconds of me riding the bike I thought this is the best bike I've ever ridden uh, and I still kind of think like that so uh, yeah I'm very much a Goldwing convert as you can tell. Okay, so it may not have sounded like it much, but that actually was the negative list, the things I found out about the bike that I didn't like, but even those, as you saw, have got some mitigating uh, circumstances around them. What about the things that really stood out to me as positives then? Well, as ever, I've written them on the list to make sure I don't forget anything, and again, not in any particular order. First thing I want to mention here, this engine, very smooth, powerful six-cylinder engine, turbine-like power, and acceleration that just keeps on pulling, is what I said here. That is a standout feature for me. I mean, not, the engine looks beautiful on the way they've styled it on the bike, um, but my goodness me, the thing has so much it's incredible it sounds lovely uh, it's just a wave of torque in all usable speeds and well into illegal speeds as well don't ask me how I know uh, this bike just pulls and pulls like a train so it should do with an 1836 cc six-cylinder engine but uh, yeah a beautiful beautiful engine I really love that about the bike next thing I mentioned here supremely comfortable for passenger and rider uh, seats are hugely and nicely padded the backrests and arms for passengers are excellent and both seats are heated and that is a great thing and even on the tour that we did in the height of summer to Wales it was lovely most of the time there were some occasions when it got a bit chilly and me and mrs fly did turn the heated seats on uh, and it made all the difference you may ask why do you need a heated seat i've never felt that my backside is getting cold again it's one of those things until you try it you don't realize having your backside kept warm means your whole core keeps warm so in the depths of winter in countries like this in the uk where we have some cold days you can still ride this in supreme comfort so uh, yeah the comfort of the bike second to none as far as i'm concerned great seats great padding for both rider and passenger really really like the comfort of the bike uh, next up, great wind protection uh, with, for visor up travelling is what I said here. The screen on here is amazing, electrically adjustable, goes up and down. Not so much of that kind of suction effect that you sometimes get on big tours when you put them in there fully up position. Sometimes the wind can tumble around you and it pushes you towards the screen. Not so with this one. If you do suffer from that, you can even buy little winglets, I understand, that fit on here and, and uh, counteract that effect. I didn't find that a problem. What I did notice is, uh, with the screen even in its down position, I could ride all day long with my visor up, even at motorway speeds, uh, and not have any wind blast in my face. So the protection on the front of this with this big old fairing, absolutely second to none, really, really good. Uh, next up, uh, passenger feels secure. Now that is a big thing. Again, if you're going to buy one of these bikes, I would suggest you're going to buy it because you're going to do cross-continent touring two up. Uh, and it's very important that your passenger feels safe and secure. And my missus reported feeling very secure on the back of this bike. She said she barely knew when the bike was leaning over uh, because the, the passenger seat is such that you kind of cupped on there. She didn't have to think about leaning with me. She's a good passenger anyway, to be fair. Uh, but she just found it supremely comfortable. And one of the biggest issues was stopping and nodding off. Next up, good range for the bike. 
259 mile uh, range out of the tank. I can't remember off the top of my head how big the tank is, but uh, it, obviously it's got a uh, fuel computer on it. I didn't do this by brimming the, the bike up and then seeing how long it went till I ran it to empty, but the bike reported a 259 mile range. I have no reason to doubt that. Um, so again, great when touring, you're not stopping for fuel uh, fills very often. Next thing, great headlights. I mean, the headlights on here are just super powerful. They're as good as any car uh, that, I've, uh, that I've seen. So headlights are amazing. And allied to that, the presence of the bike on the road. If you're in a car and you see this behind you, the thing has incredible road presence. Uh, you don't have to be in a car. You can be you know, standing on the street and see it come by. And people look at it and gawp and think, my goodness me, look at the size of that. Now, they might be having some of that un unwarranted gold wing hate. But uh, yeah, it's definitely the case that this bike has incredible road presence. And I love that about it. That's also a safety feature, I think. Okay, next up on my list, I've written down here, sat-nav is intuitive. Um, and it's uh, and that is true, the sat-nav is properly integrated into this bike, um, which I like. It's the only bike I've ever seen that does that. Not only does it have the built-in Honda sat-nav, but you can also hook it up with your Android or your Apple phone, and you can use Apple CarPlay, for example, if you want to. I never bothered with that, because I found the Honda uh, sat-nav perfectly usable. Um, there are one or two occasions when there are locations that didn't exist in the map for some reason, but you know, on the whole, I found the integrated sat-nav absolutely brilliant. I don't know why my more bike manufacturers don't do that. Oh, this really is a comfy place to be. All right, continue with the positive then. Next thing I noted here, I've already mentioned the great creep mode, both frontwards and backwards, and the central locking, which is much more useful than you might think. Um, the fact that you can, you can have the key in your pocket, or the fob, I should say, walk away from the bike, and you know that the bike is secure. Close to the bike, within about a metre, you can access all the panniers and the um, boot, but as soon as you walk away, they become locked. So you've got to remember the person with the key in the pocket has to be standing near the bike if your passenger is going to go in and out. But uh, yeah, that's really, really useful on this. It's the first bike where I've actually felt that uh, keyless locking was useful. And it's also handy because the key in your pocket, you can twist the button on the uh, on the dash and you can lock the steering and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, so that works really well. Uh, next up here, displays and instrumentation. I've already talked about the sat nav, but the displays and instrumentation on this in general, they look very car-like, uh, but I just love them. They're easy to read. They're, they're obvious. They've got dupl they're duplicated as well a lot of the buttons so you've got all these buttons on the central tank here uh, they're duplicated on the handlebars so you don't have to start pressing about on the central tank if you don't want to uh, it just all works and looks beautiful i think it works uh, uh, you know again i don't want to be too gushing about a motorcycle but big thumbs up to honda for the way the displays and instrumentation work next on my list the thing i've written here balance at slow speed you can ride feet up at very slow speeds not feet up like that but it's true you can walk ride this at basically walking pace and this is as i say the dct one so i'm not feathering a clash or anything i'm just winding the throttle on slightly and at barely walking place with two people on it the bike is absolutely stable and stays nicely balanced it's beautifully balanced this bike at slow speeds Next on the list, sports mode. Goodness me, what a difference that makes. In the main, I had this in tour mode while I had the bike, because it just uh, it has a nice sort of trade-off between uh, go and smooth riding. But if you need to get a, an extra bit of poke because you want to do a cheeky overtake or something, it's very easy to pop it into sport mode. You just hit the mode button uh, while you're on the fly and it changes it into sport. This being the DCT one, you don't even have to bring the clutch in. It just changes straight to sport mode. Um, and then the bike absolutely flies. You can feel it changing down a few cogs. It's a bit like when you kick down an automatic car uh, and suddenly it becomes a snarling beast so yeah the sport mode on this uh, absolutely loved that on the bike next on my list and i mentioned it already is the adjustable screen i love the fact that it's electrically adjustable that's always amusing isn't it for some reason uh, but it just works well now over a long period of time there is no windscreen wiper oddly <laughs> uh, on the bike uh, i did think once or twice i could do with one so maybe there's something for the future because it can get um, in the summer it got covered in flies and i forgot to take any cleaner with me to clean the screen and you are looking through the screen quite a lot of the time but uh, the big screen does such a good job at keeping the weather and wind off you uh, big thumbs up for that and then last on, on my list just the looks of the bike. I think it, they've done a great job. It's still unmistakably a gold win, but I think this particular incarnation of it just looks beautiful. It looks like a touring bike should look, if you ask me. All right, let's move forward to the pilot's area. So that's it for basically the lessons I've learned on the bike. I mean, it's, uh, it is an incredible machine. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the videos that I've brought you on the Goldwing. I'm absolutely smitten by it, as you can tell. I never thought I would be until I first rode one of these a couple of years ago. Um, and from that point on, I've always been a Goldwing fan. So thank you again to Honda for lending me this bike. I absolutely love it. I'm hoping they might be able to give it to me again at some point in the future for another tour. You never know, I'll have to put a little word in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's expensive and it's heavy. Um, we'd take that as red. It's not the sort of bike to have if you want to do it all. It's not a bike that you're going to commute on. Well, I'm sure you could. It wouldn't be ideal for that. It's not a, you know, a do-it-all bike by any means. It really is sort of a one-trick pony. It's a big touring cross-continent bike. But if that's what you want to do, if that's where you get your fun and you've got the money for it, then uh, there really is no better bike than the Honda Goldwing as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I have. I've had a great time with this bike and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Mr. Fly. Cheerio.